In the preceding lecture, we saw how the theories of Darwin, Freud, Marx, and Nietzsche set the groundwork for modernism. In this lecture, we shall trace a key theoretical offshoot of modernism called structuralism by tracing its birth in the linguistic studies of Saussure, its development in the literary studies of Barthes, and its full flowering in the historical studies of Foucault. Now, let me say now before I begin, this is going to be a very, very difficult lecture and a very compact lecture. You will probably want to listen to this twice, and I encourage you to consult the glossary, because there's a lot of vocabulary and a lot of terminology that will make this difficult. But stick with me. I think we'll get the main ideas across. All right. As, a, as the main offshoot and theoretical embodiment of modernism, structuralism also inverts and decenters established binaries. They're modernists, they switch things around, they invert them like our forefathers of modernism we saw in the last lecture. Now, what structuralism does is it privileges structure over logocentric meaning. Now, you'll remember, logocentric meaning is transcendent and originary. They don't privilege that. Instead of privileging originary ideas, they privilege structure. Now, we might be confused already because you might say that the new critics are structuralists because they're interested in the structure of the poem. But when structuralists use the word structure, they mean something much more material and physical. Remember when I told you in the last lecture, Marx says the economy forms the base or structure, sometimes called substructure, of society? That's what they mean by structure. So unfortunately, words change their meaning. So what they're saying is that the structure, the base, determines things, not some logocentric origin or transcendent idea. Uh, the famous Marshall McLuhan that many of you will probably remember, he said, the medium is the message. That had a, it has a new critical touch, but I think it's closer to the structuralist. The, the medium, the structure, is what tells you the meaning, not the originary meaning. Uh, actually, very few people really understood what Marshall McLuhan meant. I'm not sure he did, but I think he was working within structuralism, is my reading, at least, of him. All right. However, after decentering, structuralism actually re-hierarchizes, setting up a new system as elaborate as that of Plato or Kant. So they say they're breaking away from the old metaphysic, but all they're doing it is turning it on its head. So in other words, it's still very structural, it's still hierarchical, but now the hierarchy, I suppose, goes from the bottom to the top instead of the top to the bottom, but it's still very much a system, and it's very elaborate, and it's like Plato or Kant. Now, the system of structuralism, this is one of the things unique about it, is that it takes in all areas of thought and study. Structuralism is interdisciplinary and can be applied to history, psychology, anthropology, literature, linguistics, even math and sciences. So, in other words, structuralists find structures everywhere. Marx found them only in the economic base. Structuralists find them everywhere. That's the way they view all, all of the world, not just society, like Marx did. Now, let's use Marx as an example, though. The system of Marxism is so systematic, so pervasive, that it can answer all questions, whether political, metaphysical, or aesthetic. One of the reasons that the people in the former Soviet Union, after it broke down, had a very hard time readjusting is because the structure of Marxism answers all the questions of life. It's a little bit different than capitalism. I don't think capitalism answers all the structures, all the questions of life. But Marxism, or that, that the structure of Marx, answers everything. It is a full system that goes in all different ways. Now, I would say it is no coincidence that the century which gave us structuralism also gave us an era of totalitarian systems from both the right and the left. You might say that once you get rid of the logos, once you tear it down, you've got to replace it with something. If you kick human nature out the front, human nature comes in the back. You've got to find a metaphysic somewhere. There's got to be an origin. And so what happens is that God and all those other logo, logoi, that's the plural for logos, all of those are replaced by the state, finally, by the structure of the state, whether it's Marxist or fascist. Now, structuralism originated in the linguistic studies of Ferdinand de Saussure, and the anthropological work of Claude Lévi-Strauss. Later, it was adopted to literature by Roman Jacobson and Roland Barthes. And finally, Michel Foucault took structuralism and carried it into history. 
That's just to give you an idea of the interdisciplinary. I don't have time to talk about all those figures. I am boiling it down to Saussure, uh, Bart, and Foucault. Those are the three figures we will discuss in this lecture. Let us begin with Saussure. According to Saussure, no ready-made ideas exist before words. Listen now. A word, or what he calls a sign, does not unite a thing with a name, but a concept with a sound image. All right, now let's explain that. The old logocentric metaphysical idea said that behind our words are real ideas, things, forms, realities, essences, right? So what a word is, is some kind of pre-existent idea, and then the word we give it is a name. So in other words, when we use the word justice, when a logocentric uses the word justice, he believes there's a real idea, a pre-existent idea of justice, what Plato would call a form in the world of being. And that idea, that pure logocentric idea, is what's behind the word justice. That is what the Bible seems to suggest when Adam names the animals. There's this idea that there's this reality. And, you know, many people in, in the Middle Ages believed that there was a language of Adam. They believed that Adam's language was perfect, that somehow the words he chose summed up the essence of the animal. So Sur says that's not what language is. Language unites not a thing and a name, but a concept with a sound image. Now, he called that concept a signified, and he called that sound image a signifier. Uh, in other words, the letters T-R-E-E, -E, or the sound tree, that sound, that's the signifier. And what it signifies, the signified, is a tree itself. And if you mix together signifier and signified, you come up with a sign. The word tree is a sign. The sound tree is a signifier. And the object with branches is the signified. Again, these, these terms, signified and signifier, come up again and again in modern and postmodern theory. It's, it's, it's not that hard, really. A, a word is a signifier, and what it refers to is the signified. It's probably the easier way to think about it. Now, the big difference is not only does he believe that that signified has no pre-existent status. It's only justice because we call it justice. But there's no idea of justice behind our word. There's just a concept that we made up through the word. Even more radically, Saussure says that the relationship between signifier and signified is arbitrary. There's no essential link between the word and the concept. And his proof is a good one. He says if it were not, there would only be one language in the world. There's nothing uh, essential about the word tree that should connote or signify that thing with branches. Interestingly, if we want to bring in this uh, logocentric metaphysic, the Bible has an answer for that. Logocentrum has an answer for that. You know what they say? The reason language is arbitrary is because language is fallen, hence the Tower of Babel myth, right? In other words, it says language used to be pure, but our language is fallen. But in its pure sense, language is pure. Well, so Sewer says there's no such thing as pure language. There's no such thing as a language of Adam. Everything is arbitrary. Signifier and signified are just because of what we smacked onto it. There's no essence there. All right, neither, I'm just kind of summing up now, neither platonic forms nor transcendent truths lurk behind the words we use. They are merely arbitrary, man-made concepts. To, to look back at a, at a metaphor I used in an earlier lecture, the, the relationship between a word and what it means is not the body to the soul, but clothing to the body. The word is just an arbitrary clothing to the body, which is the idea. All right, if we've got that idea, now, Saussure doesn't stop there. He is a structuralist. He's interested in structure. So he's not so much interested in every individual word or what he calls signs, but he believes that each sign is part of a greater system of signs. And he's interested in the system or structure of signs. Each sign fits into the structure. And he believes, very mathematically, that that structural system goes in two directions vertically, up and down, and horizontally across. Kind of like uh, that Cartesian uh, system of math, you know, we have the different quadrants and you've got up and down and you can plot things. It's that kind of thing. It goes vertically and it goes horizontally. And structuralists make a distinction between vertical meaning and horizontal meaning. And I've got to give you a few more uh, terminology. It enforces a lot of difficult jargon here. All right. First of all, in, in this system, well, let me make one more point about the system, I'm sorry. One more point about the system. That system of language is deeper than thought. 
It's, it's, it's underneath us. It's deeper. It creates our ideas. And so Sewer has a word for that. He calls it the Lang. L-A-N-G-U-E. The Lang is the name of the whole system of language. Now, structuralists like Saussure distinguish the Lang from what he calls a parole. A parole is a specific instance of speech or writing. And as a structuralist, Saussure is not very interested in parole. He's not too interested in individual words or poems or anything. He's interested in the Lang. He's interested in the structure. Okay, now let me come back and define vertical and horizontal. A few more terminology. Vertical meaning, he says, is paradigmatic and synchronic. What do those words mean? First of all, paradigmatic relates to why one sign was chosen instead of some related synonym. So, paradigmatic, our word paradigm, why did you choose this sign instead of another sign that has the same meaning? Again, that's what paradigmatic means. Synchronic means, sort of it means with time or together with time. And synchronic meaning relates to how the sign interacts with the existing structure. An easy way to put that is that synchronic meaning is when you take the system and you freeze it and you just look at it. You look at how the whole system works. Now, horizontal meaning, on the other hand, let's get through this terminology, is syntagmatic and diachronic. Now, you can recognize the word syntagmatic has the word syntax in it. And so, syntagmatic is interested in relating how the sign functions in terms of the syntax and grammar. So, whereas paradigmatic is interested in, like, metaphors, why we choose one word over another vertically, syntagmatic is interested in how each word or sign interacts with, in terms of the syntax, the grammar, which is going across as we speak or as we write the sentence. That's syntagmatic. What is diachronic? mean? Well, that's a Greek word like synchronic, and it means through history, I guess is a simple way to put it. And diachronic is interested not in freezing the system, but in the evolution through time of the system, how the system changes from time to time. Now, Saussure and Bart, we'll see, are synchronic. They want to freeze the system. At the end of the lecture, we're going to look at Foucault, who is diachronic, and I think you'll understand better when I give you examples. One more example of vertical and horizontal that might be easy to Think of, think of a musical score. Those of you who know how to read a musical score, if you look at it diachronically or horizontally, you're looking at the melody line, right, that goes across as it moves, as the melody moves. If you look at it synchronically or vertically, you're looking at the orchestration, right, where the, where the, you know, the harp is and where the violin is, where the trumpet is. That is a way of looking at it synchronically, if, if that'll help you um, to, to make a picture. All right, another aspect of the lang or the structure. The meaning of each sign in the structure arises from the differences that set it apart from other signs within the overarching system. Structuralists are interested in difference, not in sameness. And therefore, they reverse the romantic privileging of fusion over fission, synthesis over analysis. They want to go to a scientific, positivistic approach. Let me explain what I mean by differences. For a structuralist, the only reason the word cat is cat is because it's not bat or mat. In other words, the word cat in and of itself has no meaning, only as it's different from something else. An example I like to use from modern day, are you all, do you all know how your CDs work? CD is binary technology. Everything in a CD, in a compact disc, is written in a one or a zero. And the only difference, what is a one? A one is not a zero, and a zero is not a one. That's almost very structural, believe it or not, the binary way that we can store an entire symphony in ones and zeros. We can break it down into the differences between ones and zeros. All right, let me reiterate something I said before. For Saussure, all meaning or value emanates from this system. Just like Marx, the system is primary, and meaning flows up out of the system. And this system is socially and culturally derived, and it moves upward from the material, not downward from some higher logos. So just like we saw in our Fathers of Modernism, structures at the bottom, if you want to say, and it moves upward towards meaning and art and consciousness rather than downward. So that's why I, I did the modernist lecture before structuralism, because it's an outgrowth of what I said in the previous lecture. Now, according to Saussure, society creates the system. The system is not a given that fell from heaven. Again, logocentrism didn't come out of, the, out of the head of God or Plato or anything. It was created 
by society. And the system creates meaning. It creates meaning. It does not express pre-existent ideas. It's not like there are pre-existent forms that are expressed in the structure. The structure is what creates the meaning. All right. I'm going to put it in another way that maybe will, will help. So Saussure's structuralism struck the final blow at the long-held faith in the purity, integrity, and eternality of meaning. And let me show you how it works. In the beginning, you have ontologists like Plato. Remember ontology, the study of being? An ontologist like Plato believed in the real existence of ideas and asserted the transcendent, timeless qualities of these ideas. Ontology believes that, again, there are forms that are the source or origin of our ideas. That's ontology. Well, later on, epistemologists like Kant and others, though they, they kind of abandoned this faith in ontology, but they replaced it with a belief in the equally transcendent qualities of subjective mind. Remember how I showed you in the last lecture that a logos can be the transcendental ego, you know, who we are. And so epistemologists sort of reject ontology in a way, but they replace it with epistemology. So now meaning goes inward. So there's still meaning. There's still a source for things, a fixed source. Well, as we move into our century, the new critics... Although ontological in name, really shift their faith to linguistics, to the timelessness of language. Now, again, the new critics, they're pretty much ontologists, but really, as I try to show a couple lectures ago, I really think they're putting their faith not so much on in, in ontology, but in linguistics, in words. And so what am I saying? We're moving down from ontology to epistemology to linguistics. It's almost as if we're losing a little bit of faith each time in, in the origin of things. Well, Saussure's theories of the arbitrary nature of language disrupted even that feeble faith in language, setting in motion both the structuralist abandonment of absolute truth and the postmodern deconstruction of language itself. So along comes Saussure and says, you know, even language is not a trustworthy thing. Even language is not an origin. Language itself is just a structure, just a system. And by the way, I'm using the word structure and system pretty much interchangeably here. Now, this last phase, I mentioned the postmodern deconstruction of language. I'm going to save that for the next two lectures. Right now, we're going to talk about the death of absolute truth. Then we'll get to the uh, deconstruction of language itself in the next uh, lecture, in the next two lectures, really. All right, let us move on now to Barthes and Foucault. Bart and Foucault adopt or adapt structuralism to the study of poetry and history. Let's begin with Bart. Bart views man himself as a structural being. No longer is man by nature a political animal, like uh, uh, Aristotle said, but now man is a structural being. Like Nietzsche, Bart's, Bart's concern is with the human process by which men give meaning to things. Again, meaning does not exist or pre-exist. We give meaning to things, as we saw with Nietzsche before. I created that idol of Athena. I may have thought later it fell from the sky, but I created it. So, Bart is interested, basically, he's not interested in what things mean anymore, but how they mean. How we, as human beings, create meaning. A nice way to sum it up, man is not endowed with meaning. Rather, he fabricates or creates Meaning. Let me give you an example that many of you will be familiar with. You all know the big catchword for uh, Sartre and existentialism, existence precedes essence. Well, logocentrism says essence comes first. And out of essence, out of logos, comes our existence. Bart is very much like uh, Sartre here in that he is saying our existence comes first. First, we are here and then we create our own essence. We create our own meaning. That is not to say Sartre is not exactly a structuralist. He's a little bit different, but he would share that in common since he is a modernist. Now, Bart explains to us what the structuralist activity is. In other words, what does the structuralist critic do? How do you... How do you take structuralism and put it to work in terms of analysis of literature or anything else? Well, the structuralist activity renders a work intelligible. In other words, makes a poem make sense. In other words, how do they render a poem intelligible? That's a phrase they often use. It renders it intelligible not by seeking out its hidden meaning, as maybe a fry would or something, try to figure out what it means. Rather, this is how they do it. They dissect 
and then recompose or articulate the object in accordance with man-made and culture-made rules of association. That calls for a little explanation as well. You take the work, the poem, let's say, you break it down, and then you, again, the fancy word is articulate or recompose. In other words, what Bard is saying, what the structuralists are saying is, you can't look at poetry as a thing in itself, as some kind of pure Kantian end in itself. What you've got to do is take the poem and break it down and then articulate it within the structure or system that created it. That's how you can figure out what it means. And again, he's not even interested in what it means. He's interested in how it means, how it functions. And so a work of art doesn't even exist within a system or a structure. It functions there. And that's what Bart wants to get to. He wants to get to the way that object, that poem or that painting or that symphony, whatever it is, works or functions in the midst of the system. Now, while Bart's concern, like Saussure, is to freeze a given system of meaning and look at it synchronically, structurists like Foucault prefer, after Karl Marx, a more diachronic approach. You'll remember those words. Bart is finally synchronic like Saussure because he wants to freeze the system. He wants to take the object, articulate it within the system, and then freeze it and look at it. That's a synchronic way of doing it. And, and traditionally, structuralism is synchronic. But there are some that are a little more radical, if you want to say, that are diachronic. And, and Foucault tends to be more diachronic. Let me explain how. Foucauldian structuralism combines three aspects of modernism. I want you to see how it works together and how we get Foucault, very, very influential thinker. First of all, Foucault does sort of borrow Barthes' synchronic attempt to dissect and then articulate all thought within the boundaries of an all-encompassing structure. So to a certain extent, he's doing the structuralist uh, activity. He is breaking down and then articulating within a system. But he adds other elements to that. First of all, he adds Karl Marx's diachronic view of history as class struggle and his materialist view of structure and superstructure. Now, we talked before about this idea that there's the structure, which is the means and modes of economic, and then the superstructure, which is art and philosophy and ideology. What I didn't quite say then, what I'm saving for now, is that Marx believed in what he called dialectical materialism, right? He believed that you move from one economic mode to the next, from the feudal, you know, I'm sorry, from the slave to the feudal to capitalism finally to communism. And so what Marx believed is that it's diachronic. There's not just one system. That economic system is ever changing. And every time the economic system changes, so does our philosophy, our theology, and our art. That's diachronic. Finally, he adds in Nietzsche's concern with power, or the fancy word for power is hegemony. It's a good jargon word. The power or hegemony I'm sorry, he's, Nietzsche's concerned with power and the genealogy of such things as truth and knowledge. Remember that Nietzsche said that, again, there is no such thing as absolute knowledge. We create it. That's why uh, Nietzsche wrote something called the genealogy of morals, uh, because he's interested in the way these ideas are created how they are fashioned, man-made. Now, Foucault is interested in all those ideas, and he puts it together into his system. Foucault's method is to dissect and then articulate historical events within a structure that is modeled not on relations of meaning, but relations of power. Within, that is, a power network. No more just meanings and whatnot. For Foucault, borrowing from Marx and Nietzsche, the structure is based on a power network. Power here and there. And it's a network that's always changing. Let's follow through. Now, this network, this network of power, this system, this structure for Foucault forms a discourse that determines what can be thought and said at any given moment in history. Now, what is a discourse? We can say discourse or we can say discursive structure, basically the same thing. The discourse is the structure, but the discourse is what determines what we can think or say. It's like the economic means and modes. It determines not only what we say, but even what we think. We can only think what the discourse gives us, what those power, those network of power forces that underlie us, whatever they tell us, that's what we think. That's what he calls the discourse. It's a word that's real big these days. Now, according to 
Foucault following Nietzsche, truth is one of the products of the discourse and not vice versa. It's the discourse, it's that network of power relations that determines what truth will be at any given time in history. And so, again, truth doesn't determine the discourse, the discourse determines truth. The founding fathers didn't create capitalism. Again, I'm using that very loosely. Capitalism created the founding fathers, and the same thing with democracy. All right. When the discourse or discursive structure changes during a period of historical transformation, so does truth. Here's the diachronic aspect. Every time the power network or discourse changes, so does truth. And Foucault has written many books showing how our views of things like punishment, insanity, and even sexuality change determined by the discourse. Every time the discourse changes, our view of what sexuality, what is good and bad sexuality, of what insanity means, changes with the discourse. Important distinction. For Foucault, this discourse is not primarily negative or repressive. It's not a system of thou shalt nots. Most of you listening to me are probably thinking, oh, the discourse tells you, no, 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 no. For Foucault, the discourse is actually positive. It forms what he calls a productive network which runs through the whole social body. So the discourse doesn't just tell you what not to do, it tells you what to do, what to believe, what to create. So he sees the discourse as creative, not necessarily destructive. Let me give you some examples of discourse very quickly. Let's think of the modern American democratic discourse which says that experts, authorities, even presidents can be wrong, but the people must always be right. The, the big Clinton scandal that's been going around, it's not important, you know, in other words, it's okay to say Clinton's wrong or right. Nobody cares about that. But don't say the people are wrong. If the people say it's okay, it's okay. If the people, a majority, say it's wrong, it's wrong. And this is why I think in our democracy, polling is becoming more and more and more important because our discourse tells us that the people must be always right. Why is it you've got a man who spends his whole life studying the law and then he got 12 bumpkins deciding whether you're guilty or innocent, the jury? That, that's, that's a discourse that says, don't listen to the authority, listen to the vote or the will of the people. They know what is truth, they know what is justice. I would call that the American discourse. Let me give you another one that's a little more complex. Another would be the medieval medical discourse, which labeled female herbalists as witches. Some of you may be familiar with this. You know, and maybe it's still true to a certain extent today, but way back in the Middle Ages, not even that far actually, you know, the, the medicine was very much a male thing. Not only controlled by men, but controlled by a male analytical cut up way of looking at things, right? This idea of, of you know, of uh, amputation and all that stuff. That was a very masculine discourse. Well, there were a lot of women who used herbal remedies, right? They knew about teas, they knew about herbs, they knew other ways, more, if you want to call them feminine ways, of healing people, or at least making them better. Now, that threatened the male scientific discourse, and so what did they do? They labeled those women witches. They weren't witches, they were just, today they would be called practitioners of holistic medicine. And, and by the way, this discourse has only broken down recently. This is probably true at the beginning of the century. That's another discourse, maybe a little bit more uh, fun one to deal with. Now, Foucault, what is Foucault's role as a critic? Because we're interested in that. Foucault's role as a critic, then, is to uncover the fine meshes of the web of power that lie deeper than the institutions of the state. Foucault's doing something apocalyptic too, but what he's uncovering is the discourse. Because you see, we don't think about the discourse, just like we don't think about the lang. We don't think about the linguistic structure, we just speak. We don't think about our discourse. Foucault wants to expose the discourse and show us how it works. He's not going to change it. He can't do that. But he's going to show us how it works and how it's dynamic and changes. So that's the new role for a critic, to show us how the discourse works. Finally, for Foucault, absolute truth is but one of many discourses or ideologies around which a society can be structured. I had a Foucauldian friend in graduate school, and over his bed he had a banner that read, Truth, colon, and ideology. He was a Foucauldian because he believed that absolute truth is just one way to structure reality. You can structure reality around lies or around anything else. Truth is just one way of structuring reality. It should not be privileged over anything else. That'll show you the radical side of Foucault. All right, in our next lecture, we will move from modernism to post-modernism.